it's in the days of like smoking a lot like indoors like oh, okay. when you're allowed to smoke at rehearsal spaces so me and rupert and my brother will be smoke all smoking poor matt didn't smoke and we were just endlessly chain smoking cigarettes <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Um, this podcast is about you, your journey in music. Uh, we'll talk about how the band started and then all the way up through the new record, if that's cool. Cool, for sure. Awesome. Well, uh, let's start with you, Leo. Where, where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in London. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm originally from London, but then I spent uh, a lot. I moved in uh, blah, blah, blah. Moved in my early years down to a place called Brighton, near Brighton in Sussex, in the sort of more countryside mm -hmm. area. Yeah. And did you spend most of your years there before? Because you're in London you, now, right? I'm in London now. Yeah. Okay. But, so, but most of my years, uh, sort of early years between London and near Brighton. And then the last sort of like, God, how long has it been? 15 years or something in London. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And how did you get into music? Do you have a musical background as far as family goes? Do you know, I, I mean, my mum's sort of secretly pretty musical, actually. She's got a really good voice and she played the guitar and she's she's a sort of very naturally musical person. Um, and I think we've just always grown up at being sort of surrounded by music and, and my mum and dad perhaps not be sort of playing instruments all the time at home, but they played music and we grew up on constantly music um good music being played and things that we got into very early so i think my sort of love for music and wanting to be a musician just comes from you know listening to good things in the car and constantly and and getting an early obsession with music from my parents i think did they help you out like as far as like were you in piano lessons as a kid or when did you I I remember, I remember being with my mum and when I was about six and saying in the car, I was like, I want to learn the guitar. Mm -hmm. And I started learning the guitar when I was six and I wow. had a really like terrifying guitar teacher. And I did uh, three weeks of lessons. And then I quit because he was too scary and he was like quite mean. And, was uh, he like when you say scary, was he just like trying to teach like it? Uh, he he was like, scary I, remember, I, I remember do him doing a specific thing which has like haunted me to this day on the top of the music sheet he wrote leo's lazy fingers and wow. i was like it instantly was just like started crying i was like and i remember just like being he was just like quite hard on a six-year-old if you if your fingers weren't moving slow so he sort of slightly disturbed me and i gave up for about four years and then took it up again so my first run in with the guitar wasn't necessarily the best one but I, I see i bump into cool. the guy occasionally the teacher and he's like oh, How's the, he's like he's still a guitar teacher and he's sort of a friend of, of our family and stuff but he's like i started teaching you and stuff and that was in the back of my mind i'm like you have no idea how much you traumatized me right i would have been like yeah you, you did and and for because of you, I had quit guitar for four years. Thanks, buddy. I know. It's a very strange thing. It could be your blues name, Leo Lazy Fingers Wyndham. And you're like, oh God, <laughs> that is a great you're idea. The blues, you're rocking the blues circuit in years really to come. Really slow songs. Oh, man, that is good. <laughs> I always find that funny that, or not funny, I guess, because it's traumatizing that, like, people that are teaching children like that or piano or guitar, whatever it is, like they can be so rough. It's like, why would you ever continue if you're like, okay, this guy sucks. Like what, what? Yeah. I don't know. To me, it just doesn't, doesn't quite. Uh, it's like, if you were going to kindergarten and the teacher is just super mean to you, you'd be like, well, this sucks. I never want to go to school ever again. Yeah. You don't want to be, have information bullied into you. It's not really the best way forward. For sure. For sure. All right, Matt, what about you? Were you born and raised in uh, London as well? No, I wasn't. I was born and raised in a county called Dorset in the southwest of England, um, okay. down, down by the sea. Um, it was it was amazing, very green and open and quiet. And yeah, we I grew up in this little village that didn't have a shop or a pub or anything. It didn't literally nothing. It was tiny, like a hundred people or something. Oh my gosh! So, um, it was kind of cool, um, you know, pretty remote, but in a in a really, really nice way. So, yeah. Um, and then moved to London, um, and and here I am. <laughs> okay. 
But being in a town of a, or a village of a hundred people, like how far was it to go to say the, the grocery store or something like that? Um, 20 minutes in the car. Oh, wow. So it wasn't like you could go run down the street to whatever convenience store and grab whatever you need. I mean, that's a, no, no, that's an effort. My, yeah, my folks got snowed in a few times in there because it's a really high, it's actually the highest village in the county. Um, so it used to snow quite a lot in those days anyway. And, uh, makes me oh, wow. old. Back in my day. Um, Back in my day. But yeah, the, um, they got snowed in loads and it's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Oh my God. Were you into skiing or anything like that? Or was it just not big enough? Uh, I mean, it's not, not too much skiing. Okay. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I do, I, do, um, I do really like skiing, but no, you definitely have to get on a, on a plane and go to Europe to, to get okay. skiing. A proper mountain. Okay. Yeah. What, yeah. And <laughs> what about music? Uh, was your family musical as well? Yeah, really similar to Leo, actually. No one was, I didn't have any kind of professional musicians in the family or anything, but just very kind of casually natural musical naturally musical family mm -hmm. um really similar so yeah listen just always used to listen to music um on car journeys really like you know and, and just around the house and my mom played a bit, a bit of guitar my sister has a really good singing voice and um yeah just just surrounded by music growing up and how did you like what was your first musical experience was it uh, similar to leo or you had a terrible uh <laughs> from no, traumatizing I, I, guitar teacher i did have um i my first i first started learning guitar when i was i think 12 and um i had a really nice teacher who you just go in and say i want to learn this and she'd go away and learn it and then come back the next week and would teach it to you it was very like it was really cool so it was always really exciting prospect you know knowing you were going to your lesson knowing that you were about to learn a song that you really wanted to play. So it was, I, had cool. really, I had a cool experience. I really liked it. What was the first song you asked to learn to play? Do you remember? Oh, shit. Good question. Actually, do you know what? I, th I think the first song I learned was a really simple um, song by Ben Harper called Walk Away. Because it's, like, oh, okay. it's only like a couple of strings and it's just repeated. Um, I, think, I think that was it, actually. Yeah. And That's then it was cool. um, straight into um, Led Zeppelin from there, I think. <laughs> Is it really? That's quite a jump. <laughs> yeah. I'm even going to leave you. I remember that was stage two. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> that is awesome. Okay, Rupert, how about you? Born and raised? Uh, I was actually um, born in London, but grew up in Dorset, like Matt, but like the other, other side of Dorset. We moved down when I was about three. And then, um, yeah, and also kind of like in a tiny village no more than 100 people and just kind of quite an isolated existence which is really nice did you then, know that um, growing up or no um i think we did but like not not closely because okay. matt's, matt's a little bit ahead of me <laughs> i okay. would say but yeah we we knew each other growing up a bit like similar similar paths mm -hmm. but um yeah but we were the other sides of it is you know about an hour apart um but yeah, I just grew up by the sea and in the countryside, just pretty feral, really. And then, <laughs> yeah, moved to, moved to London when the time came, and then I actually last year I've been I moved back, so I'm actually in the next door village to where I grew up. Oh, that's cool. Was it yeah. just because of everything that was going on in the world? Yeah, and... part, yeah, partly that. Yeah, I mean, actually, pretty much. We wanted to get out at some point soon, but um, mm -hmm. it kind of forced our hand, you know, me and my wife and. We also have two kids, oh, cool. so it's just get some, you know, a bit more space rather than a cramped box in London somewhere. That we For can sure. Afford all <laughs> yeah, that's that was part of our our journey too. I was like, we can live in this little place in San Diego, or we can move south of Nashville, where we can get, you know, yeah. much more space and and everything else. But yeah, um, exactly. And how did you get into music? Musical family at all? Yeah. So my my dad um my dad had a rock and roll band growing up. Oh wow! He, they used to play pubs and stuff and just fun, but he they're like fifties rock and roll strictly. But they used to rehearse at our house, so like, you know, from as young as I can remember, the, there was a band like a five piece rock and roll band playing Chuck Berry and stuff from. Wow! As young as I can remember, I'm now his bass player. If if, if we ever have a gig again. <laughs> oh really? But yeah, my younger brother's on drums, so like the old guard's been kicked out and the, his kids have been brought in. 
That's amazing. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. How, how how many shows have you done with him? What, has it been? Oh, I've been playing with him since two thousand and eight. So. Oh wow! So it's it's a yeah. thing. <laughs> That's yeah, so right. rad. I mean, mostly do like weddings now or well, parties and stuff. But yeah, it's so cool. really fun. It's really because it's oh, it's just such a fun style of music to play. You know, all that kind of fifties rock and roll. Mm-hmm. Do you remember seeing I mean, him as a kid? Like, would you go to? Or oh, was I, it to find me. I hated it. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, I got so embarrassed and we just like sulk in the corner, basically. <laughs> <laughs> oh my okay well uh let's go, let's go back to you leo so how do you get from you know you you said you moved out of london do you go back like what was the first like as far as like, playing with people and stuff or did you start a band in your town before moving to london like how did you you know i mean like, transition to this? i played I, I had two brothers so we always played i grew up when i got into the guitar and we play my little brother plays the drums my older brother um uh is also a professional musician and he's in a band um oh, he wow. sings and plays guitar so we were sort of as brothers very musical and we you know we constantly just played together and jammed and like made music and made a lot of noise and that was just like what we loved doing so that was it's just a big part of our like teenage years was just playing music and and we would play like yeah we'd play funny little gigs and occasionally like friends of our family would have parties and we were always the sort of go-to band as a three-piece and we had to butcher old 60s songs and you know and it was just really fun so I think that was sort of the first thing that really got me into playing um properly with people but then it was when we were me and Matt and Rue were all in London we had sort of left school and we were a bit older that we decided to me and Matt had always said to each other when we were in London we were like we should just you know, start a band for fun, just do this. Uh, I told Matt, I remember one day, I said, I've got a couple of songs that I sort of have written. I always wrote music just for myself. I never Mm -hmm. showed it to anybody, like, ever. And I think I sent a couple of songs to Matt on email. We were friends and... And I remember him, he, I've got the email somewhere. He goes, he he said, oh, I love it. These are, they're really up my street. Let's like, let's do this. I mean, let's get in the studio. And the, weirdly, two of those songs are two songs that we still play to this day, which is crazy. Um, and then we got Ruin uh, as a third member. And we were a three piece in this like little rehearsal studio uh, in London. And we would just get our beers and go in once a week and just, and just play and it was all for fun it was like just something to do in the evenings outside of our sort of everyday existence um and and it sort of just grew from this weird organic point of just three friends wanting to hang out um but we very quickly realized that we needed a fourth member because the three piece just was not working mm-hmm. um so we brought in my my younger brother who plays uh, to play bass who's also the guy who paints our album covers oh wow that's that's cool so so your younger brother played bass and he and he does your album artwork exactly. and then what about your the where where are you at when it comes to your brothers are you the oldest young middle i'm the middle, I'm the middle, middle. guy okay. and then my older brother is um he's actually in a, a a band called frank moody who actually play in uh america a lot they're sort of over there a lot so i know yeah. the name actually that's cool yeah check them out they're really good they're amazing sort of sort of funky disco-y vibe it's great frank moody yeah so that my brother's in frank moody um and uh but my little brother yeah so he was we we started getting little gigs at pubs in london and that's where we sort of started wow that's that's rad and he does he still play with you guys or he doesn't right no he doesn't i think think we sort of forced him to be the bass player he wasn't really a bass player he was like a (laughs) he was a drummer and he would always turn up like three hours late to rehearsals with a chicken burger and just like that's it we it's in the days of like smoking a lot like indoors like oh, okay when you're allowed to smoke at rehearsal spaces so me and rupert and my brother will be smoke all smoking poor matt didn't smoke and we were just endlessly chain smoking cigarettes <laughs> and the whole, matt i just always remember feet, uh, looking back i was like fuck that must have been a nightmare being in a box right. with like three people just chain smoking rollies Talk about willpower. I'm surprised you didn't start smoking, Matt. He never complained once. He never complained. (laughs) 
Oh, but his man. lungs have never been the same since. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the true test of secondhand smoke. <laughs> oh, my God. Literally, he would, Matt would speak and smoke would be coming out his mouth, even though he wasn't smoking. His voice um, dropped, dropped an octave then, I think. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> But um, yeah, so we that was it. We he he will be wasn't he wasn't uh he wasn't really into doing the bass, but from the start he did uh he's actually an artist, so he did that he was doing the artwork at the same time as sort of being in the band. But on the early recordings he plays bass on them um for the band. So he's still he's still there on the recordings, which is kind of cool. Wow, and what those first couple EPs? yeah he's on the maybe just the first ep he's on okay. um and then we got a new bass player who's um called will who's actually also in a very a, a big project called skin shape um okay. and so he was he sort of took over and was our bass player for several years very cool and you talked about how you guys still play those those songs that you wrote originally right those first two yeah yeah I think it was it had an acoustic version of Veins and an acoustic version of I Want What You Got. And it was just me with an acoustic guitar playing these, you know, like just recording them for myself. Um, and, and Matt just like really like responded to them and really was into them. And then Rue as well. We showed Rue and he came in and added, you know, lots of nice slide and all this kind of stuff in it. Um, and it just sort of grew from there. We have like foot, I have footage somewhere of our first one of the first ever rehearsals and i remember for once seeing it and i was like wow this is really shit <laughs> like, like that, it was before we got an extra member in the band and you could just uh -huh. see that it did not work really we i remember i just couldn't really play and sing like i wasn't used to playing and singing and i'm just like everything's out of time and like the room's just filled with smoke and <laughs> it really just more of an excuse to drink beer and smoke seriously. Yeah, it it pretty yeah. much was. That was the sort of main thing. We just wanted to hang out and just like drink and have a nice time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's funny. And Matt, um, so you guys all met what you said after college or did you meet in college? Yeah, we met at college basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so then and then inside of the band quite a few years after. So it was well, we weren't in a band together before then. Um, it was kind of when we all hit London, okay. like several years after. Yeah. What was your experience as far as playing with other people? Did, were you in any sort of bands prior to to doing this project? Um, no, I mean no. This is my first band. I used to play um, just for fun at school with some some guys. Um, uh, you know, just really rough. We used to just jam, and it was probably really shit as well. But it was just the most fun. It was one of my kind of favorite memories from being at school. Just it was very, just really kind of free and and just the best fun. So that was really where it all kind of sparked something for me. But um, yeah, Palace was my first actual band. Yeah. And did you go to school for music? Did anyone go to school for music? Or is it just, this is totally something that just happened organically later? Matt did. I did a, oh. a, I did a quick brief. I think I was, I was at a um, music college for a couple of months. Okay. But then <laughs> so I had a little, I had a, I had a taster. Um, but then uh, when I realized my folks weren't going to pay for it, it all fell apart. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's <laughs> okay. What about you, Rupert? How, how did you like get into playing with other people? Like, oh, you already talked about this. Your dad was in a band. <laughs> Duh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so then, uh, yeah. And then, but I, yeah, I moved to London with my band from Dorset. And we were going to. Okay, so you're in a different play. band also. Yeah, I've, I've played in a lot of bands and then did that for a few years and then quit that band and joined another band. And then that band ended, and then until Palace was just session, I was a session bass player for quite a few years. Okay. So the band that you're in prior, or the first band that you moved to London to try to make it as. Yeah. Like, yeah. It was like, we're going to make it kind of okay. as 18 year olds, kind of all rented a flat together, and it was just all fell out immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and then you did some session work. And then how did yeah, you end up meeting? Uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, yeah, I kind of knew them. And I actually used to play lots of shows with Leo's brother. Not We we always used to be on the same bill with his old band. 
Oh, cool. So there was like kind of that crossover. So we'd all be at the same nights and stuff mm-hmm. a lot of the time. And then, um, yeah, we had lots of like mutual friends. So we'd all be at each other's shows and stuff. And, and that's how you kind of all met together and then eventually yeah. the band forms. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Matt, do you remember getting that email from Leo about uh, the, the, and listening to those couple records that he, yeah, he sent I to you? Know. I do. I do. I remember Leo's brother saying to me for years, oh, yeah, you guys should start a band. I don't think I even knew Leo played the guitar. And then he sent me these <laughs> tunes. I was just like, shit, this is amazing. Yeah, I remember really feeling. That's so rad. And then, so once it up somewhere, that email. You need to take that out. You should post that on your Instagram or something. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Yeah, that'd be rad. People would, I'm sure, get such a kick out of that. Um, So once the band, you guys start, you said you're playing together. You, you, you're playing in the smoky studio. And then when do you start playing your first shows? And like, how does the band start to kind of build as far as like a fan base? Well, I think we played our first uh, gig we played. We had a friend who ran a night in South London and Camberwell and a friend called Max. And he put he was like, do you guys want to play? He knew we had formed a little band and we we did this one gig above a pub uh, to like 40, maybe 40 people to all like shit scared. I mean, I was anyway. I'd like never really properly never sung in front of anyone, basically. And like stood there like a statue for the whole gig just frozen um i think we got probably got quite drunk before and then we played all of our at that point we probably had four songs or five songs maybe Mm -hmm. and uh and and we did it and i just remember after a few people coming up to us and being like wow that was like really good um and that was just the moment where we sort of realized you know we went into the gig not thinking we had anything really and it was just for fun still and and we sort of just people just kept saying to us you know this is really good these songs are really good and you guys have got something and it sort of drove us forward um and we just did more and more gigs and we very quickly we, i mean we got so lucky to be honest we got picked up really quickly by a booker um mm-hmm. an agent who heard our music and she signed us like immediately the first thing we had was a gig booker and she just got us gigging and gigging and doing lots of shows every week in London to get more confident and um and then sort of we got label interest as well very suddenly as well it just all sort of weirdly slightly snowballed um and it was a strange thing because we started this thing just for fun and mm-hmm. suddenly you know all this um interest was coming in and so everything was a bonus i remember just for, for the first like year or so just feeling like this is amazing like we just started this thing for fun with no expectations and constantly getting this feeling of like you know these little lifts and and things of people wanting to book us for shows and like i think maybe this one of the first gigs we ever did we supported um james eher of the smashing pumpkins which was wow insane. It was, which was quite mad because we like um he we we were, grew up listening to the smashing pumpkins we were like mm-hmm. obsessed with them and suddenly we're like playing a support show with this guy um you know who we grew up just being completely obsessed with and just getting little things like that we just like couldn't sort of believe it was happening in a weird way and uh and we were just still very raw and like pretty like rusty and I couldn't speak in between songs. I was ter- terrified. And we did like endless sort of tuning on stage that took like 10 minutes in between songs. And like, it was pretty awkward at times, but like we gradually built in confidence. Sure. I mean, but to get early validation like that, I mean, to play a first show and have people come up after and be like, wow, like you guys are really good. Like imagine if they're like, nobody says anything or like somebody comes and tells you like, oh, you should be a mover, like starts really critiquing you. like. The fact that that didn't happen, I mean, that's huge. Yeah, no, totally. I think that was like, we didn't expect anything from it. And like the whole way through the gig, I just had the Leo lazy fingers thing, just like <laughs> rushing <laughs> through my brain. And then someone's like, fuck, fuck you, mother. No, um, <laughs> but no, it was, it was, yeah, it was a crazy. We just didn't expect anything, did we guys? It was like, no, I don't know. We just went into it for fun, really. Mm-hmm. So, so do you yeah, remember? It feels yeah. like 10 minutes ago that, that feeling stopped, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, like with that, like, were you guys working other jobs and just kind of doing this 
like were you playing like you get the booker right i mean then you're doing like how many shows are a week are you playing like once a week and you can still kind of work like when does it take over where you're like this is like my profession now like i don't we don't we can quit our jobs like do you remember that time i mean it was probably it, uh, yeah it probably took a long time but i think everyone's sort of still doing bits and bobs on the side you know i don't <laughs> think we've necessarily got to a point where we're sort of raking it in yet you right know, but really, to where you're uh, not like showing up at a nine to five and uh you know doing that and then just kind of trying to do something on the weekends or after work it, or... it feels like maybe maybe the first european tour maybe like uk tours well i don't know yeah no the, the uk tours felt like we were still slogging it you know because uh, we were just doing them in our in our tiny cars um and it, they were just so funny you know really shit cars driving up and down the country but you know uk is pretty contained and it's quite doable so it felt it definitely felt like a bigger thing for me anyway i don't know about you guys but as soon as we sort of venture into mainland europe it, it sort of feels like a much bigger thing because the distances are so much bigger and the time away is is, is a lot more so yeah, I think that one really felt different. Um, but yeah, I mean, at, at this point, like when when you do the European tour, how many did you have? What the first couple EPs out, or did you have your first record out? Must have been probably just a couple of EPs, maybe. Yeah, I think it was a couple of EPs. I think it was like maybe there were eight songs online or something like that. Like it was not much at all. Mm -hmm. um, was we it, support was it Jamie, Jamie was the first. That was the first Jamie, European. Song, Jamie right? T. Yeah. Yeah, we supported. Do you know Jamie T? We supported him in Europe. Um, the names, I the name sounds familiar. I don't, I don't, I couldn't tell you a, a record of his, but he's sort of like a big sort of English guy. Like in the two thousands, he was sort of like, yeah, he was a big sort of guy that we sort of looked up to a lot, and we got quite early got a support slot with him and played our first show and like the first show was like in Berlin and like we were just like this is insane to you know a couple of thousand people um, wow and uh yeah it was amazing it was like we just suddenly got this experience of being in Europe like we're a group of friends just like playing for someone we grew up listening to playing like big cities and it was just insane it was like the best time of our lives you know those like early shows around Europe um and then yeah first headline one was just like unbelievable just it just it was hard to sort of comprehend that people in other countries sort of listened to our music it was strange you know um it was it's still kind of crazy really yeah i mean showing up to a town maybe you've never even been to or a country you've never been to and seeing what like a line of people ready to to watch your band like i don't i wouldn't even know how to like digest that experience that's crazy yeah it's just this it, it you constantly have this feeling of like reflecting back to the early days and where you've come from and and we still have that feeling of just like um you know now when when we get you know book a big gig or we sell out a show or anything you always reflect back on the journey of where we've come from and you have this image of that first sort of rehearsal room and these steps that you take along the way and it's something that you sort of try and never take for granted you know that it's been a lot of work that's sort of gone into it and uh and we started at that tiny in that tiny three by three room in camden it's mad that's so uh, yeah but that's amazing and with with those first couple of eps i mean up until the the first record where were you guys recording those songs at were they like a diy situation or were you going into like a proper studio to record yeah, yeah we definitely yeah why wasn't it yeah it was really DIY. it was in we had a studio in uh, North London in Tottenham, it was called The Arch, and we shared it with uh, like four or five other bands, like lots of sort of blues bands, and, and we had this little sort of, it was like a little sort of scene really of group of musicians, amazing session players, and, and we shared this big old like warehouse studio with them, it was like super run down and, and so sort of depressing in ways, but it was also kind of amazing, it was like our, it was like, like our little base. And we all recorded in this one tiny room with a guy from the studio. And I was like singing through, I didn't have a pop shield. I was singing through like a, a colander, like a kitchen colander and shit like that. It was very DIY, wasn't it? Oh man. Yeah, yeah we, we ended up 
we were we were we just assumed that that would be it for those songs as in their raw form and we'd go and record them properly but our manager at the time just loved them so much and he he kind of persuaded us that they there was a vibe to them so they were the the actual ones that ended up being on the eps the original diy recordings which you can kind of tell <laughs> well kind of i say kind of you can definitely tell yeah but okay. um, you know there's a there's a vibe to them so yeah I, th I think that's something that we've really well for i've had to really learn is that you know it's okay to present something that's a sort of snapshot of a moment in time because that's just how it was so it's all good uh and yeah it's um yeah definitely I, yeah, I think I there's something cool about like that, like the grid of listening to something that was recorded that way, you know, or like, like you said, it's a snapshot in time. I've spoke with other artists that were like, you know, you, you record a demo or something in, in your, your bedroom or whatever it was. And then you move on to, okay, I'm going to take this song to the studio. And then they end up using like the, some of the, a lot of the takes that they did in, in their bedroom. Cause it's, it's hard to recreate. You almost have to recreate that emotion again yeah. right yeah it's a, it's a big thing for us it's a huge part of our process these days that we've learned that's exactly what we we found as well mm -hmm. and it's almost like you go a bit full circle don't you like we've we've done that whole thing of starting off super like raw and basic recording and then you go sign with the label and you go through like the expensive production producer process and you work with these sort of expensive people and it's great you know but like eventually you sort of get back to this point where you're like i sort of want to take it back to you know re-inject some of that sort of original rawness and 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 where everything's like not totally perfect like there's real beauty and like imperfections and mm -hmm. and the sort of cragginess of our old recordings and stuff and i think when we get too polished and squeaky clean we all feel a bit like ah fuck this is just not us you know um we're we, we we yeah those early recordings even though when we listen now you do feel a bit like wow these are so rough like the playing is like kind of mad to us but like there's a charm in that you know yeah i like i said i think there's something cool about that and it's cool that even when bands will put out like oh this is a, some b-side that they recorded in the in the early days like people will latch on to those and be like oh like i love this early whatever green day recording from like 91 or whatever it was like I, there's something cool about listening to those old snapshots of bands especially bands that you really really like and then going back and hearing where they were when they started yeah i think yeah. they're just more real aren't they yeah for sure what was your first uh, studio like big studio experience probably was it on that first record was that jeffrey well, was yeah first yeah. record with adam yeah, yeah. What was that like? I mean, Robert, I'm sure you had played in studios before, right? As a as a session musician. Yeah, yeah, no, I'd, yeah, I've definitely done quite a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, the first one, the first, but the first session was the first record, like in with a proper studio. It was like I can't remember. Was it four? Like a total of four months recording. It was the most intense recording I think. Wow, we've done to the to to date, you know. And like, um, I remember once. For some reason, Matt wasn't around that a certain week, and Leo and I and the producer spent because I think we were all quite new to the like the big studio thing and didn't really know how to allocate our time. So we spent a week on a guitar tone for one part of one song. Oh my and then, gosh! It, and we were all just completely insane by it. Well, we were insane before that to even start working like that, and then completely lost it by the end of that week. And we scrapped <laughs> the guitar tone, didn't we? I remember like. Yeah. He's, there were there would be points where he was getting the guitar tone and we were like in the room and we were like this sounds this sounds great this sounds great and then he just kept on turning the things and going past <laughs> it and then we were just like oh he's lost it and, that, and you know there's no way back to find it again and yeah. we just go it was like four in the morning and he was like moving mics around and we were just like oh my god this is like and then everyone got really sick and we had, like had flu and it was, <laughs> yeah, it was in the winter wasn't it it was, yeah, it was in the winter. Pretty, yeah Nicole, I remember just like spending half the time asleep behind the door, like in that corner. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, we, now the... we talk about we talk about the big studio experience. Let's just be clear that it wasn't a big studio. It was like it was a, it was, it was a big small. studio in the, in the sense that you know it was it worked. Yeah, it wasn't it was the just... it wasn't the little rehearsal space. 
Yeah, yeah it, it wasn't was a a of place, but it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't Abbey Road either. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, it wasn't sexy in any way, and it, but everything did work. But it was like small still. Yeah. And the building has since been knocked down. Occasionally, we go past. And we're like, <laughs> really? I, went, I was with my mum for some reason. With with my mum, like going <laughs> to London once, and we drove past it. And I was like, going to point out the window. I was like, a year after we did the album, I was like, oh, this is where we did our album. And I just pointed, and it was just air. There was the building just wasn't there. The whole thing had been demolished, and it was just like this one gap in a row of buildings. I was just like, wow. Good oh really. man, that, that sucks. Really and yeah. heard our record and they were like, yeah, let's knock it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you guys are done after four months and they're like, yeah, let, let's just destroy this place. <laughs> Leave the evidence. <laughs> uh, with that, um, with the second album that you guys put out, was that any different than, than the first or how did you progress? It was sort of interesting. We did it with two nice. people. Yeah. We did it with a woman called Catherine Marks and a guy called Luke Smith. And Luke Smith's studio wasn't like fully built yet. Mm -hmm. It was a brand new sort of studio. So it was quite sort of a DIY experience. And we were sort of building it with him at the same time. So oh, it, was wow. sort of, it was a bit sort of weird, wasn't it, guys? Yeah, yeah. it was, it was, it was, um, <laughs> <laughs> Matt, Matt had to. We thought we thought Matt was going to be doing drum takes one morning and came in later that afternoon to find he'd just been putting up blinds. I was like, <laughs> I was like up, halfway up the ladder, dripping with sweat with this drill, like because mm. <laughs> like, like, the I was we tried to do drum takes, but the sun was so hot coming through the window that and the air conditioning didn't work, so it was just wasn't possible. So it was kind of it had to be done anyway, but also you know it was we were helping him out so so yeah we we, we spent a morning putting up blinds which is quite fun. oh my i wonder if that was part of his plan he's like okay well if i get it really hot right here i can get these guys yeah. to do some manual labor for me really really cool space um and it was it was a really cool experience like all these experiences you kind of learn mm -hmm. things about and not not just not just the physical experience of being there but like sonically and the music side of it you kind of learn so much about what, what you kind of like and don't like as a band so it's all good experiences they were all just kind of different i think the second half of that recording process was definitely a bit different because the studio the studio was very kind of sleek and and plush and, and sexy um, oh so you guys got a little upgrade halfway through the album yeah yeah so we did no, some tracks with, with some tracks with another one was it like did you have like like how did you decipher where you're gonna record the songs, or was it just kind of happened that way? Like, okay, we're gonna do these here, and then oh, we've got these more songs. We'll we'll continue it at this this new studio. I think the 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 uh, A and R guy, uh, a &R guy at the label just he he kind of had it in his head that we would we would um, just try doing a bunch of songs with one producer and some with the other. I mean, we oh, kind okay. of had an idea of, of how to split those songs. It wasn't just random. There were certain type of songs that we did with the with Luke, the first guy, and then certain type of songs we did with Catherine for the second half. So it was, it was kind of planned that way that we'd work with two different producers oh, okay. just to sort of what, what kind of sound we'd get for the different types of songs. Um, but then, yeah, it was mixed by a guy who kind of brought it all together and make it sound, sound like it was all from, from one place. So it all worked mm -hmm. out. Nice. With, um, and you got to tour that record, right? From what I read, you, you did pretty extensive touring on that album. Yeah, I think we toured a lot, didn't we? We toured yeah we no touring yeah that was a big one but like Although, with that i mean how we got to the US, didn't we but then just when we got back we had the uk tour cancelled didn't we just <clears> yeah. Got to the US. yeah so you were able that was my next question was if you were caught up in the in covid or w were you stuck somewhere on a tour but you guys got had gotten back and you're waiting what on the next one and it got sh and the world shut down yeah. i think yeah, we, we got back two weeks before everything shut down right so, yeah, yeah we, got, we got quite lucky we made it back from a huge tour in the states mm -hmm. and then in the gap between starting the the uk tour everything went crazy <laughs> and oh, it was cancelled yeah. and that was the last that was the last touring we did the the us tour was the last touring we did yeah yeah and you got shows coming up though and these will be your first what ones back 
Mm. Pretty much, yeah. The first, well, well, we did three festivals at the back end of last year. Okay. And then these, but then we've got in a couple of weeks, we're doing UK um, and a big show in London and then uh, America in America and Canada in April, middle of April for a month. Right. Yeah, huge like, shows in America. I mean, I was just looking at yeah. the, because I'm from, like I said, San Diego, but I, I did radio for a long time in San Francisco and you're playing the Fillmore, which is a huge, beautiful venue. And yeah. we'll turn in LA. I mean, these are, are these going to be some of your bigger shows? Yeah. I mean, over there for sure. Um, yeah. The, do you know what? It's just growing. It seems to be growing so fast over there. Mm -hmm. And um, like, we just seem to sell a lot of tickets there, which is just completely crazy. And uh, yeah. And so that it feels like a big step up on, on this tour and like the venues. Yeah. Like we've been Googling images of like, the venues and they just look so amazing and like oh man they look like sort of old theaters and oh yeah yeah the, it's crazy the Fillmore is one of the coolest venues uh, you haven't played there yet no or this would be your no. first time yeah, I know no. what they do which is really rad and um they'll make a poster for your show I don't know if you heard of what the Fillmore does so they'll make a they make an individual they make a poster for every show that comes through there and they like it's just specific to that show Wow. And they only make so many copies of it. So like a buddy of mine's band got to play there. And like, so he, he gave me one of the posters, but it's rat like, cause there's only so many, there's only a handful and they have an artist that does them all. So you guys will get, you know, your poster of your show Sick. that's specific to that one, one night there. So kind of like remember, oh, and I think wow. they hang them all in the venue at somewhere. Cool. Wow. So, oh, that's amazing. Cool. Yeah. So that's something to look forward to when you get to San Francisco at least. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> San Francisco is awesome. We had a good time there last time. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Last, yeah we played last... um, Bob Skaggs' venue, wasn't it? But well, I can't remember what it's called. But oh, it was amazing. Yeah. It closed yeah. down, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Yeah. I'm um, trying to think. I don't know. I haven't been. I lived there like in 2012. I can't think of what it would be. I don't. I'm mm -hmm. like too hip to it, but I know that the film is sick. Um. So you <laughs> put out you you put out EP what someday somewhere in 2020. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Was that recorded over the pandemic and pretty much? Yeah, that was some a couple of them maybe were old tracks like that we had sort of in the locker and then um, I'll, a song called I'll Be Fine. We literally recorded it sort of like uh, separately, like we just passed this passed the recording down the line and everyone added their bits and um, with whatever equipment they had in, in the lockdown and and weirdly it just like came out really nicely that one i think mm -hmm. was and that Matt, i mean obviously that's what a what a way to have to kind of adapt to everything i mean your yeah. whole industry as far as like being around people you know live shows like everything just comes to a, a crashing hold and then you kind of have to adapt was that i mean obviously that was scary but like how did how long into it were you like we should probably just start writing songs and and figuring out something which ended up becoming that ep I think like literally like the first day of that happening. Oh, wow. Straight in, like straight in and just writing every day and just um, uh, just going. Yeah, just really like going for it. And it was just the perfect conditions, you know, to uh, to get some good writing done without, you know, not having distractions of everyday life and just suddenly like, OK, well, what else can we do but do this really? Mm -hmm. um, and so the songs like came very quickly from that experience and it was a case of just passing it to each other and and uh and you know none of it was sort of in the early in those lockdowns obviously we couldn't sort of jam through the songs it was all just um passing it along passing it down the line and and most of the early sort of demos for the album came out of that sort of experience um and then it for cleared the, up for the new the record coming out yeah said? for the new out oh, yeah wow. for the month um and then we when things opened up we went in the studio and sort of jammed them and and recorded them really properly as sort of demos and i think we had like 23 songs maybe for the new album that were that were came out of the lockdowns basically um, wow yeah and how many of those made the record all of them 12 is it guys uh 13 counting another another one yeah. recorded and got 13 record. But but those were all from those. They all started out in those original sessions that you guys were kind of sending down to each other. Pretty pretty much, yeah. The majority, I think. Um, well, a good chunk at least, yeah. 
So what was it like going from, you know, passing them all down and then you now it's like, okay, we can kind of get into a studio together, like jamming on some of those songs for the first time. Was it, were you, were you guys fumbling through them at all? Or like, I mean, you hadn't played them together as a band, right? It's like, okay, here's Leo's take. And then I'm going to pass it down to Matt and, and Rupert and so forth. And like, now you've kind of created this demo of a song and now you've got to go to a studio and kind of put it together. Was that how, what was that experience like? It was, it was cool because um, it was a really exciting time because we had just moved from our studios. So our old studio that Leo had talked about earlier, we, we left there and we moved into our own rehearsal space um, just down the road. Um, and for the first time, we've, we've got our own little box <laughs> where we can leave our stuff set up, ready to go, mm -hmm. mics all, all set up. Um, so it kind of it was really exciting because we we it was it was literally the first time we'd we'd been able to just have total freedom to be there all day all night and just kind of experiment with stuff without needing to make way for another band who had booked a room or something like the setup we had at the other place so it was a really kind of free time it was really hot that summer and yeah um and the world was super quiet and and everyone was kind of like at home reflecting and and there was no cars on the street and you could hear the birds singing and it was just london was a crazy place to be and uh, and so yeah we were it was it was i think we were really really proactive as soon as we got into the new studio the songs just started taking shape pretty quickly i think um it was a cool time was it um when, when you have that much time on your hands like for this new record did that, uh, do you feel like that affected the album at all? Or like, were you, do you feel like you, were there, was there any point where you're like, okay, you're like over listening or like overthinking because now you have like, you know, kind of un, unlimited time, so to speak, when it comes to putting the record together? Um, I don't think so. I don't okay. think so. I, no, think, really. I think the opposite. Oh, I really? Opposite, I, I remember saying, we were all saying to each other, God, it's so amazing to actually have some time on this record. I think um, it allowed us to be much more free with our experimentation of, of sounds and production production approaches that we knew we wanted to try and achieve, that we would get our kind of rough demo version done um, that, that, was, that we then take to a producer to sort of do it properly. But that's how we kind of thought it would be. But um, yeah, we, we had, the time was really good because we had we did lots of experimenting and, um, I think it, it helped us um, develop our sound and be more brave and experimental. Um, and yeah, so, so yeah, I, I think the time is a really good thing, actually. Some people really thrive under the pressure of having to like work under a yeah. six time to deliver. But, and, and, you know, sometimes that, that is actually really good for us in other aspects of our, our kind of, musical careers but for this one it was time was really good that's awesome to hear because like like you just said i've heard the other side of the coin where it's like yeah now that i have all this time like all i do is listen to the song a million times and then i find these little things that i want to go back and tweak just like a i don't like how i pronounce this word or that you know you can almost like get to the point of overthinking every element of it definitely definitely yeah. Yeah. What do you, what, like, with this record, what do you, I mean, people are receiving the album, obviously, well. The singles that you have put in out are doing amazing. I'm just looking at Spotify numbers alone. And the tour selling out already multiple shows and multiple dates. What are you most excited about, like, the record coming out on Friday? I think just, like, being able to, be just simply just, like, people, the idea of, like, people being able to hear it is so exciting because I think we feel... I mean, everyone says this when they release an album. It still feels so cliche uh, as a thing to say, but like we genuinely feel like this is the best thing we've ever done, and mm -hmm. that the songs are the strongest sort of collection of songs we've ever done. And and I think we feel very proud of it as a sort of body of work, um, and feel like it's a step up from anything we've done. So I think just getting people to hear it and hopefully people enjoying it is just like the big, it's a big thrill. It's also like slightly nerve wracking, but like it feels just exciting, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet there's got to be a lot of jitters before you put a record out. Like, 
a lot of thoughts and emotions and then when it's out is it just like okay like ah oh, okay we can kind of breathe now yeah definitely and I, I think for us it's again I know it sounds a bit cheesy maybe but for us a, lo a lot of the, the songs are quite kind of you know they are quite sort of personal and they're, they're about kind of real things and, and that not just obviously lyrically mainly but you know a lot of that goes into the music as well and I think because of that, it's, it does feel like a, a sort of part of your 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 character, your soul even is, is being put out there. And a lot of the songs are, like I said, just a, about kind of really real, real things, real kind of human things. So, um, yeah, I think there is a definitely a bit of nervousness that because you hope that they'll land with people, you hope they'll connect with people um, because it is sort of an extension of yourself. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's kind of nerve wracking, but exciting at the same time. Yeah, because you're being completely vulnerable. I mean, you're putting out songs that are true to you and, and lyrics and everything that's true to you. And if I I mean, you could read a million comments that are all, like how great it is. And then I'm sure the one is always just like, like such a dagger, especially since it's like you're, you know, being like I said, just so open with your your emotions and, and putting onto a recording. Yeah, I think with anything you sort of create in any way and you know anything we you, you do it's it's personal you know and for us i think i mean i feel like we probably got fairly sort of thick skin but like you know i tend not to like read too many right comments. read too far into I think, it i think we've generally been quite lucky you know like i don't think we've been trolled that many times by any sort of nutters you know like yeah, I, I, I was just, yeah i was just like read i mean you guys get so much positive reinforcement all the time but i mean when it comes to a new project you're like is somebody that's a fan of mine gonna be like oh they you know change their sound or what you know yeah. what i mean like is that that's, that's that can be a hard one with people like you know if anyone ever not that it's really happened but if uh -huh. the idea of people saying you've sold out i was like i'm terrified of people thinking that you know but like at the same time i think the key thing is like we write music for ourselves we write mm -hmm we write music that we want to hear we write like write the music that if we could find a band to play a certain type of music it'd be what we're putting out you know it's like mm -hmm. the music that feels right for us and actually at the end of the day so sort of don't really care too much because it's it's if we're happy with it that's all that matters you know if it so sort of satisfies us like with what we've made then that's all that matters really and if people aren't sort of too into it or whatever you know that's also okay you know right i love that please um, everybody <laughs> but please right. like it yeah. <laughs> or we will all yeah do something terrible yeah uh, well a real quick comment on the selling out thing i i think it's interesting because I don't know how old you guys are, but when I was growing up, it was like the big thing was like, oh, you you know, they sold out. Like, I can't believe they changed their sound. And you could only like, if you like punk rock, then that's all you were really allowed to like, right? Around your, your core group of friends. But with, with music so accessible nowadays with like apps like TikTok and stuff, I think people are more like striving for that. Like young, the younger generation is striving for the sellout. Like I want to have the viral song. Whereas before you didn't, it was uncool to be the, the, you know the center of attention in the in the big band you you latch on to the bands that nobody knew of yet and then it was like oh now green day's putting a record out on a major label like they sold out like it's funny how the mindset has almost kind of changed in that sense yeah no it's true i think so the commercial is sort of celebrated in a weird way so mm -hmm. maybe we need to like i don't know what's the most sellout thing we could do like <laughs> That's oh, the thing. Like if, you, if you're if you're striving for the sellout, then it's already contrived before you've even started. Like it's not, it, it's by definition, it's not real. You know, right? So, right. It's, it's, it's uh, I don't know. Or do you get this know. kid that I guess, I guess, I guess that's the trick. The trick is making something contrived land with people and make it seem you know make it connect to people <laughs> yeah i mean and that's what you guys have done since day one right i mean there's the kid that wrote the tiktok song that gets really big and then it's all they're trying to do is strive to write the next song that sounds exactly like the one that went viral for them or whatever it is 
I mean, there's something about yeah, it. Sounds a, it sounds a bit like us, except we could do with a bit more of the viral thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> except we for need... like you have longevity, which people yeah. that put out the one hit aren't going to have. I mean, the fact yeah. that you've got three EPs and then this is going to be your third record, people are still showing up and the shows are getting bigger. Obviously, you're not doing the, I'm going to shoot to try to follow what that first yeah. hit was or whatever. I think as soon as you start to do that, like, you're in big trouble, you know? And I think there'd be moments where we've just in our heads in the past, we've been like, we've been told by people as well. Like we have a song called bitter and people have said, said to us like write another bitter and things like that. And you're just like, what does that even mean? And, and sometimes it, it used to get in our heads a bit and we'd be like, okay, we need to use that as a sort of benchmark. But then you quickly realize it's just like, that's just bullshit. That's just another one of our songs. And actually, the whole point is we need to just like follow our trail and and not sort of look backwards and at our own songs to sort of direct the future, you know. Mm -hmm. And like, if you start doing that, then you're sort of on your way to failure. I think. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I completely agree with that. And I appreciate you guys doing this. This has been so much fun, uh, and I can't wait to hear the rest of the record. Like I said, the the songs that you have out now are are great. Obviously, in the old back catalog, if you guys don't. Um, Thanks, man. And yeah, mm -hmm. and. It, and I'm excited for you know your tour. You're not coming to Nashville, but it's cool. <laughs> you know what? I think we are in the next one though. The one after, I'm pretty sure we're, oh. we're, we're going to be in Nashville. So yeah, so send us a message or something, and we'll we, when we do, and we'll get you on the list and come down. I'd love that. That'd be such a such a great time. So yeah, I'm excited. So um, well, I have one more quick question for you all. I want to see if I can get an answer from each of you. If you have any advice for aspiring artists, good question. I think maybe just like, I mean, I think just like trust your gut, I'd say in terms of like songwriting and like, um, you you I feel like just trust your gut, try not too hard to be like someone else and to emulate other people, just like, see where it's your gut sort of takes you and your heart takes you and, and write about things that are real to you, you know, I think in terms of writing, I'd say that um yeah what do you guys just, think? just um i'd say just enjoy it like it's just the greatest fun you can have whether it's just like playing in some cat like a small cafe just you or like hanging out with your mates in a rehearsal room or just doing what it's just enjoy it it's just it just it's such a fun way just make sure yeah just enjoy it <laughs> That's yeah. much better than my one. I take my one back and actually I just, I'm, I'm going to copy. You one. second, you second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, I'm, you, Matt? I'm just going to back up what we said. It's that's bang on. It should be all about doing it for fun. And if anything happens, then it's a bonus. Bring me a bad word.